so you were doing signs for a while, right? Yeah. But you were also a firefighter. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. I had a I had a sign business. I was a draftsman. I was tra a trained draftsman, and I decided I didn't want to sit at a desk all day. Mm -hmm. So um, I was a volunteer firefighter, and then I started a sign company. Uh, I went from drafting to a sign company because it gave me the freedom mm -hmm. to not, you know, to make my own schedule and stuff like that. So I st I was doing back then. There were no computers. You did everything by hand with a a, a squirrel tail quill. And, mm. and lettering enamels and you would uh, you know you'd paint signs and you draw the the designs for the customers by hand and same thing with truck lettering mm -hmm. and uh, I kind of got hooked on that you know and it took a while to to master it and I always I, I remember someone came to me uh, that had a farm stand and they wanted uh, il illustration on there. They wanted a, a picture on their doors of a basket of fruit. Mm -hmm. So I did that and I was moved by it. And uh, it, it just always stuck in the back of my mind. Mm. And then um, I became a professional firefighter in New York City. Mm -hmm. And then I did the sign business on the side. Mm. And then kids came along, you know the deal. And um, so I kept the sign business but kind of downscaled once I became a professional firefighter. And then computers came along. Um, and speaking of the fire department part of it, um, the beauty of, of being involved in, in an industry like that is within that group, there are, are a whole host of, of uh, tradespeople. Mm -hmm. You know, we had a social worker in our firehouse, we had plumbers, carpenters, and I happened to be the artist. So I would mm. design, you know, things for the, you know, the different events that took place. And, um, you know, I actually built and painted our kitchen table in the firehouse, put murals on it. And uh, like the resident artist. Yeah. Yeah. And I ended up, it, it was a beautiful thing. Looking back, I ended up with a reputation throughout, you know, not the entire New York City Fire Department, but various people I knew, and they would Shanghai me to their firehouse for, you know, do some art, art projects. Yeah, art projects. Like we were in the city not long ago, Diane and I, we went to a show and we stopped at a firehouse in Midtown Manhattan. Mm. And we, we uh, talked to the guys there, and they didn't know it, but, um, you know, 20 years earlier, I had worked there for two days and two, uh, you know, so I came from the Bronx where I was stationed mm -hmm. and a guy that worked in Midtown went up to the Bronx for a couple days so I could do gold leaf on these fire trucks. Mm. And um, it was amazing because, you know, my neighborhood was nothing like Midtown Manhattan. Yeah. You know, in Midtown, you know, tourists would come into the firehouse, they'd want to take pictures with you. And the neighborhoods I worked in, it was, you know, very gritty. And, mm -hmm. uh, Which firehouse were you? Were you Bronx, right? Yeah, I was in the Bronx. I was in a place called 41 Truck mm. near the Bronx Zoo. Yeah. Is there a number to the firehouse? Yeah, they, the... they usually go by the truck numbers, 90 and engine 90, ladder 41. That's awesome. Yeah. So they all have, they all have logos yeah. that they're very proud of. And, and uh, so I have, uh, you know, I designed the logo for that company. And they, it'll be wow. there forever, you know. So, so let's back up a little bit. So you were doing signs, and then you had the opportunity to become a firefighter, and you took it? Yeah. Um, did you go to school for art? I went to school for drafting. Oh, so so you, you didn't just find yourself in, you know, signs and vinyl lettering. You had gone to school and came out and and got the job or kind of started your own company? Yeah, well, I was a draftsman probably for um, seven years. And then I realized I didn't want to sit at a desk all day. And a friend of mine actually said that, you know, he suggested I learn truck lettering because mm. he knew I had, I was artistic as well, but he knew I had a, a, a background that could probably 
transition to that. And he he worked for this uh, Allied Moving Company. He's like, we can't. The guy we get, he he's so busy mm. that by the time he gets here, we've got four or five trucks, and then he charges us an arm and a leg. And I was like, ooh, that sounds good. There's already a business waiting for you. Yeah. So and uh, you know, I drew as a kid with my mom. My mom was very talented. Mm. My sister as well, who my older sister. And you know, I used to see her art books, and I would just be I was fascinated by it. Yeah. There was a guy Frank Frazetta back then. Oh yeah, Frazetta is amazing. Yeah, so she had all his books, and I would just look at them, and I just I couldn't believe that people could do stuff like that. That's amazing. Yeah. Yeah, I just actually I think uh, did a road trip and drove through uh, Shrouds. Uh, I think it's East Shroudsburg, uh, which is where his museum is. In oh, Pennsylvania, yeah, we really? should go for a trip, man. Oh, I'd love to see it. Yeah, but yeah, the fantasy art thing is is amazing. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah, people back then, uh, there was a guy not far from here who was doing a lot of airbrush work back mm -hmm. then. He'd do these big murals on vans and pinstriping and things like that. I found it fascinating. Yeah, I met your sister Cheryl, right? Yeah. Yeah, she came and took the class that one time. Remember? Yes. And painted, and then she loved it, and then she was doing it for a while. Yeah. She's still doing it? She's back in it, yeah. yeah. She retired. She was in the, you know, pretty much the corporate world for years and years. Yeah. And she retired, and now she's doing it. She's in a gallery down in Dade City, Florida, and she's selling paintings. And happy. Yeah, she's thrilled. Yeah, she's it's so thrilled. funny because the, the corporate world idea, I've been in and out of as well, you know, working at Ralph Lauren for almost 10 years. I did five uh, from 2011-2016. It definitely felt a little empty, and uh, people would be like, how are you motivated to go home and paint every day? And I'm like, it's just kind of boring. <laughs> and this is my creative expression that I can get out. And I feel like a lot of people come to it later when they've retired, but, uh, you know, luckily I was in the art department at Ralph Lauren, so I was doing creative work, but also listening to somebody tell you what to do isn't always fun. No. It's like a commission that really doesn't sit well. Yeah, that's what it felt like. Yeah. It's funny because I used to think about that. Like, could I, is it is it similar to doing commission work all the time in which you're expressing other people's ideas? Um, if I were to just go over to art and just do commissions, and I thought about that and, and thought like, it just seems the same. And therefore, I was like, art to me has to get my, me, my expression out and uh, that's kind of where I've gone with it but of course I still do commissions now I just try not to make them a bulk of of what I want what I do all the time yeah yeah uh, it's so funny I think we we probably gravitate to this for the freedom and mm -hmm. the and the the mad the magical thing that happens when like I was always like when I first started painting I felt the magic, yeah. but I didn't really feel it until I started doing portraits. Mm. And, you know, we did a few together and we we we, we painted together yeah. regularly for a while. And to see a face evolve in front of you on the canvas yeah. and the, you know, you, you just lay in the values first and you take a one dimensional surface and it becomes this this face yeah. especially when it, it, the grisaille stage and it, yeah. you could just leave it like that you know it's a beautiful thing it's kind of like a, you know it's kind of like a birth you know in a sense yeah. where this this thing this, this this thing of beauty evolves right before your eyes yeah emerges off the canvas into um something yeah, yeah. we used to get together i think he had taken a couple classes with me we used to do the workshops at dorothy's yeah. and then i think we used to just meet as a group on i think it was like wednesdays at Dee's, Dee yeah and then just hire a model and i give a little bit of feedback if somebody asked for it but i was kind of in the trenches uh with you all just drawing and painting but yeah it's so fascinating to even see like where we've come uh where we were at the time and where we are now uh, but also the beauty of this, I think it's, it's funny. Cause when I talked to Max Ginsburg about this, he's 93 at 
at this time. And I, and I say like, Max, why do you continually pain from life every day? And he said, I just feel like I get better with everyone. And I'm like at 93, uh, yeah. it's amazing. Yeah. But it feels like that's the, the, the richness of what art does. It's kind of just like, yeah, I got something. You can express yourself now. Your paintings are gorgeous, by the way, and you're expressing yourself. But to get the language at the beginning takes crafting, but you don't just get there and get it. You're no. still no. evolving, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't know how long it takes and if, if everybody comes to this conclusion at some point that there is no end and there is no, you know, I studied for the lieutenant's test. I studied for three years. Yeah. Hours. I'd get up five o'clock in the morning, study till eight, work a day. You know, it was a tremendous. But when it was over, I was lieutenant. I yeah. got promoted. I passed the test. I got promoted. Just like Amazing. your 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 master's degree. Yeah. There's an ending. Okay. Now I can move on. Cut the grass. Clean the gutters. Whatever. But I don't see that with this. There's something yeah. about the painting where it's. I'm never gonna. We change. Our goals change. You know. Yeah. What we're after changes. We've expressed the idea. We've got a new idea, a new direction. Um, yeah, so let's go back to the firefighter part of it. So you were actually in 9-11, right? Like yeah. You are part of it. Are you okay talking about that? Yeah, yeah I can talk about it. Yeah. yeah. Well, we just talk about it a little bit. Okay. Um, so in New York City, uh, 2000, September 11, 2001, mm -hmm. Yeah. So you're working at the firehouse and no, I was on vacation. I was here. And I was actually working in the garage doing a, um I had two Mercedes pedal cars that the fire department had bought and given to me to put graphics on, to, mm. to decorate them fire department themed however I saw fit. And they were going to be auctioned off at uh Fashion Week. Mhm. Mm when is Fashion Week? What time of year? I think there's two of them. I think one's in the spring and then one's in the fall because we used to, working at Ralph Lauren, we used to do it. Yeah. I would think so, yeah. Yeah. So I was literally uh, out in the shop there uh, putting gold leaf on these little pedal cars that they were going to auction off for, I think it was a, I have a plaque out in the garage thanking me for what I did, but uh, the Marie Glasser Foundation, I think, was mm. did donated all the stuff. And the phone rang, and, uh, you know, my buddy said, put the TV on, you know. Yeah, that's what everybody, I think, said. Yeah. So I came yeah. inside. And then, you know, uh, shortly after that, the phone rang, and they said, come to work. So I got my car. I kissed my wife goodbye. I didn't think I'd see her again. And I drove to work. And um, I really thought that that was it, you yeah. know. I mean, I've been in fires where I was like, Holy shit! This is this is yeah, this could be it. This is Harry. It only yeah. happened a couple of times where I thought this could be it. This is a bad spot. In twenty one years, that's pretty good. But um, yeah, I, I I really believe that I wasn't coming home that day. And a, a friend of mine, he lives a couple of houses up, was working, and he worked in uh, a rescue company. Yeah. And his wife called me while I was driving into the city, and she goes. Tell me he's okay. He's going to be all right. And I'm like, I knew he was dead, you know. Yeah, and I yeah. lied to her. I said, oh, he's going to be, he's, he'll be fine. Yeah. He's going to be fine. Those guys are sharp and everything. And it turned out that he, when he showed up to work that day, they, they, they work with five firemen. And mm -hmm. he was the sixth. So they sent him somewhere else. Wow. And he survived. Wow. He survived that I'll day. So you told her the truth. I told her the truth. I didn't even know I was telling yeah. her the truth. But yeah, so uh, we went in and uh, it was complete mayhem. And um, which is totally unusual in the fire department. It's such a, it's a paramilitary organization. Yeah. And everything is so structured, you know, it's not, it's not, uh, it's very unusual. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, so we ended up taking shifts going back down there, you know, after, after the towers had collapsed work you know the recovery and um so i didn't go down for a couple of months after i went down uh the day after the night after you know for a couple of times throughout the first few weeks yeah. and then what happened was i got assigned to another firehouse that lost like 12 guys mm. so what they did was they 
they chopped up all the firehouses and they shifted. Evenly distributed? Yeah, they distributed who was left. Yeah. They yeah. kind of made two fire departments. They made a fire department that was strictly working at the recovery site. And then the rest of the guys got shifted around. So I'll just tell you this quick story. I think time, enough time has passed where I won't get in trouble. The firehouse I went to was a special operations command place. They, they did all, they were, had all this technical training and they were uh, special operations. So we cleaned, it was a disaster. So I, I was a lieutenant, so I was in charge of the place. So I told the guys, we're not doing anything until this place is spick and span. So we cleaned three floors, top to bottom. We got everything done. And the guys that were assigned to this place, since they had trench certifications and diving, they were working in the tunnels of the collapse. They'd come back in, in the evenings and and then go home from there. And the captain would come in and I would see him and I'd say, Cap, you know, the place is cleaned up. Can I do anything for you? And he said, no, nah, no, nah, nothing, you know, because there's a lot of paperwork in the fire department. So finally he goes, after about the third time of me hounding him to help to do something he said well you know did i got a list of guys who were working and he nobody did the payroll yeah so people were just getting paid whatever their normal checks were yeah so this was probably you know many weeks into it and so he gave me from this pocket he gave me a list of guys and the hours that he had been keeping track so he gave me a list of all the guys he had them in different pockets and places in his file so he did the payroll for the entire company. Wow. It, it took me, I was up till five o'clock in the morning doing it. Wow. And then the guys that were missing, you know, nobody was giving us any direction. So I made a decision. I'm like, you know what? I'm giving these guys 24 hours of overtime. It's just a number on a sheet for every day up to this point. Yeah. And I did that. I said, screw it. What are they going to do? They're not going to yeah. fire me. Yeah. So I, that was a tremendous amount of money. So like I said, nobody was doing the payroll. So I decided to do it. And I called up the uh, messenger van. I said, come pick up the payroll. And they came. And, and those guys got a, a ton. Their families got a ton of money. Yeah. And I, I don't know. They deserve it. Yeah. And I don't know. You yeah, know. That's the least, right? For yeah. What they were put themselves in. Yeah. To do. Yeah. So I don't know. I kind of looked at it like. This could be stealing, but yeah, what are they going to do? Take you know, and it worked out. It worked so out. so after nine eleven, you stayed on the the fire. Uh, how long did you stay there for, at the firehouse? In that place? Yeah, we were there probably another, probably a month. And then um, I went back to my own firehouse. And then I went down to the site for a month straight where I would report there every day yeah. on the recovery site. And uh, that was a remarkable experience, wow. really, really, wow. really something. And uh, thanks to your service, is that proper to say? Yeah, you like, could you could say that. I mean, Lieutenant, yeah, it's amazing. Well, we drove, you know, you'd leave there in the morning and drive home. There'd be people on the side of the road. Oh, you're a hero. And you're like, no, I don't feel that. You know? Yeah. No. Yeah, there's a, there's just a whole sense. I, I remember exactly where I was. I think everybody remembers exactly where they were. I was in a federal building, actually, um, at the time when 9-11 happened. And where? Yeah, exactly. It's like, where the hell were you in a federal building yeah. at 8.30 in the morning? I was trained to be a mailman. So we were there, and I remember um, we were watching a video and all of a sudden, the, the guy came in, put the lights on. He's like, we have to stop this. And he wheeled in a TV and showed us. And I was just like, what's happening? Yeah. You know, and I just remember calling my mom, uh, just thinking, like, I'm getting drafted. Like, and dad was in the military. So I was like, yeah, I'm, I'm going. Yeah, and sure. uh, just a, a whole bunch of uncertainty. And then after, still not having any answers of just kind of thinking, where is this going? Um I don't know. Terrible times. But it did bring out the best in people. Yeah. I mean, the things the things I saw down there were unbelievable. Like driving home in the morning, you'd work 7 at night to 7 a.m. 
I, I I almost didn't make it home a couple times. I drove off the road, you know, and woke Tired. up. Tired, yeah. So they had a church on Broadway where you could go and get, it was very quiet. You could go and get tea and some, some things to eat and warm up. So I said, you know, I'm going to go sit in one of those pews and nod off before I drive home this one yeah. day. So I walk in there and I'm a mess. I got all my stuff, tools clanging off me. And I just sit in a pew and this woman comes up to me. And obviously she knew I just got off work. Yeah. But I, I was totally unaware of, of who around me was, was observing what. So she said, um, uh, would you like to lay down for a while? I go, no, I'm just going to sit here for a while. She goes, no, no, I, we have uh, we have cots set up for people who just yeah. want to. In the back. So I said, yeah, all right. So she goes, I, she, you know, she says, I know you have all your tools. We'll watch it for you. So I laid down on this cot. You had to go upstairs. They had converted these the balconies to all these cots. Mm -hmm. She goes, I'll, I'm going to be sitting in this chair. And I'll, um, I'll watch your stuff. So she sat and minded me while I slept. And I slept for 20 minutes, half an hour, whatever it was. And I thought that was the, just the most beautiful thing, you know? Yeah. And she... You know, I got to talking to her before I left, and she came from the Midwest to volunteer. Yeah. yeah. And she just, you know, she just helped Help whatever up. way she could. And that, that's what she did. She helped yeah. comfort people. and But there's millions of stories like that, that people came from all yeah. walks of life just to, to help. Yeah. yeah. Come together. Yeah. Yeah. Man. So, so after all that... Um, Bring us up to, you know, where did you go up to Mount Kisco and, and do one of the fire? Because cause you're affiliated with the firehouse here, right? Yeah, it was a volunteer here. And um, we we actually designed and built a beautiful memorial here. We raised like $180,000 in eight months. And we wow. built it ourselves. You know, it's a beautiful memorial. Wow. And those there's a bunch of people here very committed to never forgetting and they have a big ceremony every year yeah and um th actually this year they brought in the tunnels to towers traveling museum mm -hmm. into town i didn't get involved in it and uh but our committee our 9-11 committee um hired that thing and 850 children from the local school district went through and um i hear it was a very remarkable experience for them wow so, yeah, there's still a very strong presence here in town Yeah, for that. So you came up here, and then you were a volunteer. Is that transitioning over back to doing some of the sign work? Or, like, bring us up to, when did you leave the firehouse? Well, I, I left the city in 2007, I believe, after mm -hmm. 21 years. And it's... It's kind of funny where the, where the art and firehouse connection comes in. Um, it's not like a beginning and an end. You've always had art and draftsmen, you know, vinyl sign, stuff like that in your life. So did you just pivot over to doing it a little bit more? Yeah, so I retired and then I opened up the retail shop for the sign company. I'd always done it on the side because being a fireman, you get... You work 24-hour shifts. You get some long stretches between when you have to go back. So I opened up the sign shop. <clears throat> excuse me. And, you know, I didn't like it. I had to put a key in the door every day, pay the rent every month, the insurance. You're, yeah. You know, you're writing up quotes, and everybody wants an estimate. and A lot of back and forth, right? It's, yeah. It was, and you have to do the payroll there, too. <laughs> it's nonsense. It's all yeah. the, like, the, the small things, fulfillment right yeah it's 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 so detailed yeah oriented and you really have to be savvy because you know you work for nothing otherwise you know yeah. so i did that for two years i had a two-year lease on this building and i decided this is not for me was that here in kesco yeah it was in town here so um i closed the shop i said i'm not doing this yeah i we, we were close to paying the house off I didn't really need to break my neck. Yeah. And um, so I closed the shop, but I kept some really good truck lettering customers because mm -hmm. 
they they were easy you know those were they were beautiful people to work with yeah and um yeah i kept them and i still have them to this day you know it's awesome but it's, it's just a few people and I'll, I'll do a truck lettering job once in a while did the um there seems to be some overlap with the firehouse did you do truck lettering for the firehouse yeah i did a lot of gold leaf pinstripe yeah. work over the years it's awesome yeah gold leaf is such a neat thing do you still do it for them no no i won't do it it's too much work yeah yeah i just started getting into gold leafing on my frames and um i i should have called you i forgot you were doing this but i uh i accidentally ordered some frames with no uh gold lip usually i get it with a bronze lip and uh i forgot to put the g at the end of the order oh, yeah, yeah. It was an 80, 84, usually G, uh, even though it is bronze. And uh, and I had a gold leaf kit around. And it was a painting that went to the Ridgewood Art and Suit show. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I really like the gold lip on my frames. And then I just had, a, I had it, and I was like, let's do it. Let's jump in the deep end. Really? Yeah. And then just tried it, and I was like, it's so fun. It is fun. Did you gold leaf frames at all? No, I never have. Oh, man. Yeah, you know, I, I've never tried the, to gild on any other surface that wasn't flat hmm. so kudos to you because i looked at you know i looked at your painting i looked it's at okay your frame. it's not the best it it it, it never struck me as oh that's know, good but it does sparkle so bronze yeah. leafing is i think just a cheaper way to do it and a lot of the paint on ones are i think bronze leaf but gold leafing it just hits the light hits it so different we'll have to do one Oh, it's I don't fabulous. know if I could lead it. You probably fabulous. pick right up. You know the artist Joseph McCurl. I'm sure you've seen yeah. his paintings. His Landscape father, painter. yeah, his father was a gilder, and he worked with his father when he was younger. And uh, he posted online some pictures of these great domes that they do. They did it with gold leaf. Wow. They're they're gilded. They were they were gilded. So how do they seal them? I don't know that they do seal them. Wow. Yeah, I think it's they just leave the gold out there wow it's got to be redone every so many years it's crazy because when you look at it to buy the leafing it it always comes up that you can eat it and i was like really because they put it in chocolate and stuff like that yeah yeah there's a there's a liquor that has flakes of it gold schlager yeah that's i it. thought about it the whole time when i was doing it. i was like in <laughs> in college we used to drink this all the time and it was like there's gold at the bottom <laughs> and it had it back then huh? yeah cinnamon schnapps it's gross i don't think gold. anyone would drink that now there's only one reason i would drink that get hammered no to see just to it's probably not appropriate to say but just to see if it passes through if it's still gold you know oh <laughs> that's yeah. funny yeah yeah all right so back to back to your story so you had you did the two-year lease in your business yeah i did the two-year lease and man it really just rubbed me the wrong way i, I felt like a prisoner and um so I came home one day, and I think we, I think we, we did pay the house off. In that period of time, and uh, I said to my wife, I said, you know. I don't know what it is, but I got a, I got oil paint. Yeah. I, I'm going to the art store to buy oil paints, and she said, don't. But you had never done it before then. You just like woke no, up and you're I, like, I, I, I dabbled here and yeah. there, you know, and it was hard, man. I'm like, how that? Because going from lettering enamels. To oil paints is like yeah it's it's like trying surgery for the first time yeah well enamel dries really fast right yeah and it's a whole different you know yeah uh, you could pour it out so she goes no no don't don't go to the art store you bought 10 years ago you bought an oil painting kit you know the kits you used to get yeah you'd buy them and it had the little stuff yeah she goes you bought it 10 years ago and I got tired of moving it around the house it's upstairs in the whole closet in the back so I went up there and dragged it out, and sure enough, there it was. The oils worked, and I started. That's how I started oil painting. Wow, that's and, awesome. Yeah. So is that around like 2010. Uh, yeah, yeah. And um, well, what had happened was I designed the 9/11 memorial in town here, and uh, that was a big deal. It was really. Uh, so I met this doctor, Ed Cornell, really nice guy. My wife knows him from the hospital. And we were pitching people for donations. So I met him, became friendly with him. He's a great guy, neurosurgeon. And he said, he saw the designs and he goes, well, 
you did this? I go, yeah. He goes, you got to meet my friend Alan Rheingold, who was an illustrator. I don't know if you ever heard of him, but he did a lot of uh, Forbes covers, mm -hmm. uh, Playboy magazine, a lot of work. And he was teaching in town. Mm -hmm. So I met, I met Alan. He said, you got to get Alan involved in this 9-11 project. So Alan came in, I met him, and he wanted, he taught at Parsons, and he taught people privately. So he said, I want to get my students involved. We're going to have a 9-11 art show. Mm -hmm. So they had it at the library here in town. And Alan told me, he had this, he, Alan's a lovely guy, but he's got this high squeaky voice. You got to come, you got to come to my class. I have a class every <laughs> Thursday at the, at the church I teach every Thursday night. Yeah. Come to Parsons, see me at Parsons. So I, I was in the middle of working. Yeah. And building that memorial. So I, I never went to see him. You know, I didn't have the time. So I was driving home one night past the church feeling bad because months had passed since he's, he invited me and he would call me and leave messages. So I walked in one night to his class just to apologize and say hello. Yeah. I had my work boots on and dirty clothes. And I go, hey, Alan, uh, oh, sit down, sit down. Said, no, I just want to stop it. No, sit down and sit down. So he sat me down with his class and he, he ripped a, a page out of a magazine. It was a frog. And he said, here, draw this. He, he taught colored pencils. So, I, so he gave me a pencil, and I drew this frog. And he goes, um, I, and had I, yeah, I was out of the fire department for a while. So he goes, he, he sees me draw the frog, and he's walking around to his students. And he, he kind of hugs me, pats me on the back, and he goes, you're one of us. He says, you need to come here every Thursday night. Just make time. Take time out of your life to come here. And it felt it felt so good to be welcome like that, you yeah. know, into this group. So I did. I made time. Maybe not soon after that, but I made time. And I drew with him for like two years. Mm. And then, yeah, that kind of came before the oil. And then I was like, I, I need to oil paint because he wouldn't really let me do. He would let me do graphite. And so it was almost like a studio. Yeah, so what they what you do when you go to a what do they call it communicante the and the art you know where they make you draw you can't paint I would tell Alan I want oh, to paint yeah. he's well, not that's what we did draw yeah well, I tell you we only drew for the first year yeah and then it was value that was it yeah yeah and then we worked our way towards color but it's good oh, it's great you have to, drawing yeah. is the whole what's the structure it's the scaffolding or the foundation for yeah. a house that you're building on top of so yeah it's good it's huge so i stayed with him for two years and then i couldn't take it anymore i had to <laughs> i had to left yeah. i had to paint i wanted color you know yeah so yeah i left i left that but i i see him occasionally i haven't seen him in years but yeah he did a lot of he did a lot for me that's awesome yeah yeah he well he accepted you in and and said come do it yeah so then yeah. after that that's what 2012 or something 2013 oh no that was yeah that's about when it was yeah. yeah so after that that sounds about when you time you took my quick workshop with dorothy right i think it was like two-day workshop i remember meeting you out front and uh you had the van yeah. and i think uh i knew you're a firefighter yeah and i was like hey so, nice to meet you yeah so i i painted with um with uh this fellow jeff barbet Mm -hmm. I, I painted for a year on my own and got completely frustrated. I was going nowhere. And I met this guy, in, Jeff Barbet, at a show in an outdoor art show in Norwalk, Connecticut. Mm -hmm. I fell in love with his paintings, and he said he taught in Dobbs Ferry. Mm -hmm. So I went down and took some classes with him. And I got into a show. It might have been affiliated with the Art Students League. It was across the river. Mm -hmm. Rockland County was like an affiliate. But anyway, uh, there was a gal there who I met. I was marveling at her painting. My wife and I were at the show. And she she came, she came. heard me talking about her painting. And uh, it was Laurel Stern Bach. Oh, yeah. So we started chatting. And our daughters went to high school together. They knew each other. Oh, wow. Yeah, it's a small world. So she said, oh, you have to come and paint with us. We paint in Bedford. So I was new to the art world, and there are these groups. With Grace, right? With Grace DeVito was yeah. there, yeah. So I go to paint with uh, these 
mostly women and um she says uh todd casey is your guy really yeah laura laurel stern told me todd Casey because she'd seen my work wow. i was very you know crude at the time I'm surprised anyone knew who i was oh no time. no she 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 uh she said i'll never forget we were at her house and they were uh it was a good group i painted there a few times not a lot but she goes look up todd casey Huh. And I did, and that's how uh, you ended up teaching me. That's so cool, because I didn't meet her till you introduced me to her. But um, I'd heard of Grace, because I'd seen her, I think, in Susan Powell. But then I went over and painted with them, and I was like, you guys are amazing. Like, At Laurel's house? Yeah, yeah. such a, a fun group. And we hired, um, I forget the model's name, Sandra. Yeah, remember Sandra? I think once you painted her once, it's like you painted her two hundred times more. Yeah, I think they worked with her for a while, but yeah, that's so cool. I didn't know. That's the story. Well, the Dorothy found me because, um, you know, like I started my career in like two thousand ten. I had finished two thousand ten, two thousand eleven. So for me, I was just like putting my stuff in magazines and shows, just trying to see where I could go with the career, and. I was teaching at Mass Art at the time in Boston driving because we lived in New York. And um, I had a small group of three students there that I would teach once a week when I would drive up. And then I'd drive home late at night. I'd do it all in a day. And then um, I decided I wasn't going to do it anymore. And then serendipitously, Dorothy had reached out to me to say, "Do you would you teach me? Because she had seen my painting in artist magazine because i had won second or third place or honorable mention or something and she loved it and she was like oh you're right next door and um i said sure and said like you know if you can get a group we can get a group raid so she got three people and then we built that into like i would go once a month and work with her and donna and jerry do you remember them donna. I think, yeah i think you met donna yeah so there's the three of us that we did for almost a year once a month and then it turned into workshops uh, where we do like two-day workshops, which is where you came in. And then we were doing every Friday. Remember that? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And it was awesome because it, it was a group mentality and like we got together and just talked about art. Yeah. But I got to lead. And for me as a teacher, I was starting to be a teacher. You know what I mean? Like I was starting to be like, I was teaching at Mass Art, but I wasn't, I was just like, yeah, I can go teach perspective or mm -hmm. you know i think i was teaching all of my media techniques uh but now it was like the whole gamut of what i was you know the atelier kind of thing uh which led to the books so it was kind of like all these things where people were asking me things to put together and i was like yeah and then i began to organize it so anyway i don't want to talk about me but yeah, that's but how we came together. Yeah, but it's fascinating because um, I didn't I, when I when I worked with you, I I couldn't really appreciate what you were giving. Mm. You it seemed so natural, and there was a good there was a big group. There was Lori. There was a bunch of people. It was that that um, yeah that lovely gal who passed away. What was her name? Barbara. Barbara. Yeah, it was so but sad. it was a big group, and you went around and you you. You know yeah. the beauty of it, working in a in a workshop like that is, well, you're painting away, but I'm listening to what you're telling the next student yeah. and the next student, and I'm trying to get these pearls of wisdom as you're working the room, and it works. I mean, this is this this oil painting is not something yeah. that you can pick up on your own. I don't think there might be a genius out there who has, but. I don't know. A lot of people always say that, and then they're like, "Yeah, but I watch YouTube videos." I don't know. It's like you watch videos. Something. It's not like anyone's ever detached from everything. And then they just learn how to oil paint. You know. I think. Yeah. Whatever. Plus, it's all only bragging. Yeah. Uh, everyone I meet. Part of the reason why I love to do these interviews is everyone I meet has something to teach me, yeah. or a different way to creatively think about something, and then I take that in my head and think about it and go maybe i'll try that you know yeah. i think it's a wonderful thing yeah it is i mean and that's the beauty of doing what we do we get to meet so many other people i would have yeah. never met Dee Dee and her husband john i know you know yeah how remarkable is that 
Yeah, and Dee Dee was, um, yeah, she had taken a class, and then we were doing Wednesdays at her house, and Cindy was there, and Beatrice, and we would get together and just hire a model. And remember, we were doing high school kids for a while. Yeah, because a friend of a, my friend's son was in high school, and they were happy to get paid to just sit there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, remember you there, was a, there was a couple that fell asleep. They were like, they would nod off, you know, yeah. these young kids. Yeah. But yeah, that was a great experience. And, um, you know, I, I, I tell you that the, the camaraderie in the artist group is very similar to firehouses, you know? Yeah. The, the, with firehouses, you live with each other, you're tight, you go through these life threatening uh, moments together, these high stress moments. And artists, I, I'm just loving the camaraderie. And really find your tribe, right? I found my tribe, yeah. Yeah, that's great. So yeah. so let's bring it up to kind of where you are now. So, you know, we worked together, I think it was like 2013, 14, 15, around there, mm -hmm. um, which seems about the lineage of kind of your story. Um, but then you, uh, I think I stopped teaching there because Dorothy moved away. Yes. And then, but I've just seen your work flourish since, so... I mean, I guess I would say the beauty of, you know, you said you underappreciated it. I don't think that's so. I think you probably took it in. And for me, I'm always like, it just takes time for it to, to sink in. Like, even if we get something, I, I can't go do it. Yeah. Like, I can't watch somebody hit a home run and then be like, yeah, I got it. It's like, no, now you have to, you get some of the technique and now you have to work through it. But I bet you part of it was like you had to take that. But you were also, in addition, working with guys like Joe McGurl. You were having him, right, to do workshops? No, Joe, I worked with Joe Paquette. Joe Paquette, that's who it Joe is. Paquette. Yeah, because McGurl is uh, Cape Cod yeah. and Paquette is Minnesota. Uh, Minnesota. Yeah. yeah. Oh, so talk about Paquette a little bit. Oh, he's a great guy. Yeah, I loved him. Well, we, he studied at uh, Ridgewood Art Institute under John Osborne. Hmm. And John took him under his wing. Uh, John, I don't know if you know John Osborne's work, but he I feel like he's always in the show, right? Uh, the, no, he's no, no. His he, he was an instructor there at Ridgewood Art Institute for years, kind of the patriarch. Yeah, and just a genius. Painter. And Maynard Dixon, right? Yeah, May, uh, no, uh, Arthur Maynard. Arthur was Maynard. That's what it's not before Maynard. him. So I think Arthur Maynard studied with would it have been. Uh, well, Frank Mason and he painted together, plus, uh, who's the guy? That, Frank Dumond, Frank yeah. Vincent Dumond. Yeah. So that's the lineage that came, uh, and they taught that prismatic palette. But uh, Joe Paquette w studied with John, and I studied with John, and I I, um, I wanted to paint landscapes. I'd, I'd seen these beautiful landscapes, and uh, the ones that interested me all kind of looked the same. Yeah, and I came to find out that that was the Dumond palette. Mm. So Joe, Joe studied there at Ridgewood Art Institute, and they taught the Dumond palette. So I ended up becoming friendly with Joe. I took a workshop with him in Mamaroneck, uh, a design and composition workshop in landscaping, mm. and that was a great workshop. And then we stayed in touch, and then I hosted two of his workshops here in town. Amazing. And uh, yeah. It was a really good experience. And again, I met people I'm still friendly with from yeah. that I would have never met, you know. It's like yeah. if you if you next time you're on the beach, you know, just think of this. You walk down the beach. My wife and I we go, we walk for miles on the beach. You know, uh, 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 short of someone running into you, you really don't talk to anybody. Yeah. But if you walk down the beach with a fishing pole, everybody wants to know what you caught, what's the same thing with painting. If you're painting on the beach, yeah, forget it. Everyone wants to come it and talk opens, to you. Yeah, it opens so many social doors. And, you know, for me, I was always socially awkward a little bit, you know. And really? Yeah. And That's then human. this painting business has, uh, you know, eased me into these other relationships. Ah, uh, okay. It, you know. Yeah. It's a, it's a common thing. So. Do you like it when uh, people come up and talk to you while you're painting? Um... It depends. Yeah. Yeah. I don't mind it, but nice I used to hide. <laughs> yeah. I don't, you know, I don't, um, I don't plain air paint that much anymore. And usually when I do, it's off the beaten path. So, yeah. You know, I did, and I did some work in uh, New York City with a couple of people. Um, you know, we 
I got invited down to paint with uh, a few people and nobody really bought a couple of people would come by and look and say oh that's nice you know and yeah keep going I I I always feel like landscape painting is a sport it's the way I talk about it you're battling the weather yeah. the light changes yeah. insects um, yeah. there was a reason to be frustrated and people uh, who all want to come up and talk to you and show you pictures of their cousin or aunt or uncle or yeah. grandmother who funny. does it uh, funny. as well. Yeah, I have a funny story. I was tra I, I got into the OPA, um, I think it was 2018, the national show in, in Utah, mm -hmm. in uh, St. George, Utah. So I drove out. I t talked to my wife. I said, I'd like to drive across country. And I got into the, So my painting was out there for this OPA show. And I said, but I want to drive across and paint. Mm -hmm. I sleep in my van. And I'll paint my way out to Utah. You guys can fly out and meet me. We'll, we'll celebrate the show. And we'll see Zion and all these other places. And um, so I'm driving out. And I, I paint with a, uh, somebody I know in North Carolina, Jeff Barbe, actually. Mm -hmm. And then I painted in Texas and uh, I go to Oklahoma and I'm driving around looking for a place to paint. And I see this junkyard and uh, I pull over and there's a there's a couple of horses walking through, or, you know, through the junk cars and stuff. And I knock on the door. There's a guy actually uh, painting a barn and I, a young kid. So I said, hey, do you mind if I paint here? And he goes, I don't know. I got to let me ask my dad. So he goes into the house. And this older fella comes out and he goes, you want to paint the barn? I go, no, I want to do a painting of the, no, I want, I'm a painter. Oh, you thought you wanted to physically go paint it? Yeah. So I go set up in the junkyard and I'm painting this, this old, I think it was a 40 Ford. I have it in the garage, I think, the painting. So the father comes down, you know, they come and look. Yeah. And he comes down and he goes, you know, my son is a really good at art and, you know, everybody Everybody has somebody Everybody. who's really good at art. Yep. So, I mean, we're literally, I am in the middle of nowhere. So he says, I'm going to get him to show you. Said, yeah, yeah, okay. So I'm painting. The sun comes down, the kid who I saw, and he happened to be on Instagram. And he was phenomenal. Mm. The kid's a, a real talent. Mm. He was doing ink drawings. And I got really excited. I'm like, oh my. And the father's like, How, what do we do to make him, you know, to capitalize on this, well, as I say, he needs to go to Oklahoma City. You know, go there, get in some art groups or art school, do something, paint with people, Network, go. Yeah. You have to, yeah, go learn, you know. You, you, he, his, he had such talent, raw talent. Yeah. I asked him, have you gone to school? No, no, I just, so. Open I, book. Yeah, he said, get books, do this, do that. But that was a one time, you know, you hear it all the time. My uncle, you know. This kid was really good. So I followed him on his Instagram and I stayed in touch with him. Have you done anything? You know, can I do anything for you? And it, he just, he didn't. So, ah, yeah. Oh, that's too bad. Yeah, I'm literally in the middle of nowhere. Well, I have a funny story, very similar. Um, when I was at Water Street, uh, Jacob had started this thing called the Hudson uh, River Fellowship. It was the first year and it was free, but you had to apply for it. Very hard to get in. Um, and I got in just because I was in the atelier, like I didn't have to apply. And um, he at the end just said, yeah, come on up. And I just remember going like, I haven't done a lot of landscape painting. And everybody was going to, we were up in, um, I think it was, is it, no, it's not Hudson. It's um, up in the Catskills. Everyone was going to Catterskill Falls. And I thought like, maybe I'll paint somewhere else. And me and two friends went off the beaten path and went right instead of uh, right instead of left. And uh, we just saw this big barn. Actually, no, it wasn't a barn. It was horses with a barn and then a beautiful mountain in the background. And um, we ended up, we ended up like trudging through like all this grass to get to the spot. And uh, after painting for like an hour, beautiful horse, it was like the perfect scene. After, uh, after an hour, this guy just pulls up yelling at us. What are you doing on my property? And it was just like, this look, just looked like beautiful, you know. And um, he ends up, my buddy went over and talked to him and he kind of smoothed it over. And he's like, you're painting? What are you painting? <laughs> and uh, 
he was like, next time call me. And we were just like, well, how would we have your phone number? And he's like, it's on the billboard or something. And uh, it, it just, yeah. people get mad because you're trespassing at the beginning. Yeah. But at the end, he, uh, I think he looked at the work and was like, oh, that's so cool what you guys are doing. Keep going, but call me next time. Yeah, yeah. Don't just surprise me. That's funny. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, I mean, there's always funny stories when you begin to kind of, I always see places where I want to pull off and I'm like, I would like to be on that person's property. Remember Dee Dee used to paint people's houses from their front yard? Yeah. Like yeah. stuff like that, where it's just like inspiration sometimes catches your eye and it sounds like that's what you're doing uh, when you were in Oklahoma, just oh, kind yeah. of driving around and yeah. looking for something to paint. Yeah. Yeah, we're, we're, we, I didn't realize till recently, but we, we look at things differently as artists. Yeah. And, you know, for years I had been after our local village to clean up the woods over here. They could make a beautiful, it could be a beautiful park. They did nothing. So I just kept hammering and hammering, please, you know, we'll, we'll start it. So my family started the project and then it kind of took off from there. But one of the council people, uh, I saw at an event and she's, you know, it looks beautiful now, but you saw it through an artist's eye and we couldn't, you know, we couldn't see yeah. that. Yeah. It's hard, hard to realize that. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. So, so where, where are you today with your work? I mean, you know, obviously every time I look over, you're winning an award, we're in a show, we're traveling, you go to Steamboat, uh, St Steamboat Springs. Yeah. Uh, I think OPA is part of that, right? Yeah, OPA is a big part of uh, my traveling and uh, the awards and stuff. And you're on the board, right? Yeah, I'm on the board of Oil Painters of America. Yep. I um, I joined OPA probably, I'm going to say six years ago. Yeah. Because maybe longer. It might have been 10 years ago. I was painting at Ridgewood Art Institute. I was a very new painter. And in this class, in John Osborne's class, you your palette was the prismatic palette mm -hmm. that was it like one day i bought a a tube of flesh tongue mm -hmm. you know i'm like oh this is going to make portrait easier so yeah. he happened to be walking by and he looks and he goes throw it out the window what is that <laughs> so, it's a paint i just bought he goes throw this away yeah. so they were you know they had their and i can see it is they had their structure and that's what they taught you know yeah. that's what he taught so this woman, Sue Barassi, I loved her paintings and I, I would go look at her paintings on our, on the breaks and stuff. I wanted to paint like her in the worst way. So she saw, um, I was motivated. So she wrote on a piece of paper, like five things to do to get better. Mm -hmm. Join the low, you know, join the local art organizations. And one of the things was join OPA. Yeah. Join so a local and then a bigger one. Yeah, join, you know, your local, like, uh, I forget what that I, the Osling Arts Council, Greenwich Arts Council. Mm -hmm. Get involved in those organiz other organizations. Oh, and take workshops, too. Mm -hmm. So I joined OPA, and, um, you know, I liked it. it was I learned a lot from them. And, um, yeah, I, I think I grew a lot because they, they offer a lot. Yeah. And, um, like, when I was first first started painting um i was plain air painting uh -huh. and i had been posting my paintings online on facebook so a gallery was opening up in katona and um i remember that you did well with them yeah i did very well there so anyway so they they were just going under the process of renovating this space so the young lady who sarah who was partners in the gallery called me and said but i see your work online i'd like to come and see it so she came here and she said okay we'd like to represent you in the gallery I said fine and they picked out a bunch of paintings and they you know they were showing them and the opening they were going to open the doors this weekend and I happened to be painting on like a Wednesday night up at this farm so I get back to my van the sun sets I go back to my van and I see there's a voicemail from her it's like oh call and she goes listen we're, we're not open yet. You know, our opening is Friday, but this woman just walked in and she saw your painting and bought it. That's the, that was a voicemail. And my hair got, I started to tingle. I got yeah. like goosebumps on my head. Yeah. And I was so thrilled. Yeah, and I'm like, it's a good I know, feeling. yeah, I'm like, I know what I'm doing the rest of my life. I so, love those calls. It, it's so, yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah, it was that was the first painting I sold in a gallery and I couldn't have been more excited. Yeah. It was right up there with, you know, when she said I do and uh you know, watching your kids be born. It was yeah. it was special. Absolutely. Yeah, it was special. So yeah, so I joined OPA and I've been doing well. I got into I got signature signature status, which means Congrats. You, yeah, you get into a certain number of national shows. Yeah. And uh, regional shows. It's it was a it was a tough thing to do and a little bit of a nail biter. And then um I happened to become friendly with Jeremy Gooding. I don't know if you've seen his work. Yeah. Beautiful. And still life painter. Yeah, he uh I offered to help him set up the studio portion at the national show. They have two day wet wet paint competition. Plain air and then you can paint in the studio. And you won one year, didn't you? I won last year, yeah. yeah. First place. Amazing. Yeah, it was a shock. It was good really, it was neat. Yeah, that was the show in Charleston. But uh my wife screamed. We were sitting in the in the <laughs> auditorium and when they announced the winner she screamed. She just couldn't oh, control that's amazing. it. Yeah, it was so cool. I ran up on the stage. It was such a thrill. It really I love is. how much support you get from your family too. Your kids fly out sometimes. Yeah. And, right? Didn't they all fly out? I think it was then the van trip when you told me what you were doing it. I was like, I wish I could come. Yeah. I think it was like five years ago and Scarlett was just born. Yeah. And I was like, that is amazing. Yeah. You know, the, there's no, this, I think this is an amazing story. So that's my first year OPA. No, that was my second year I got into a show. So we flew to Steamboat, and I painted. I painted feverishly for this competition, and um, it was the first time I competed. And you know, I I met these ranchers. I painted on their ranch. They, they were beautiful people. I just it was a fantastic experience. So I paint this little skull. I painted like six paintings in two days and we decided amongst everybody that was the one to enter so i entered the the uh, painting and that was more of a family trip you know i, I took a couple of classes at the because it's a, the, the national exhibition and convention they give classes and stuff and we're staying in this beautiful place the steamboat grand so now it's the night of the opening and awards the big night so i had a painting in the national show and i had a painting that i had in the competition so I tell the family, we all we all huddle, and there were boyfriends there too. And uh, I said, "This is what we're going to do," because it was at the Steamboat Art Museum. We're going early to the show. We're gonna the minute the doors open, we're gonna go in. We're gonna take it in. We're gonna eat, drink, and then when it gets crowded, you know, and too much, we'll split and we'll go to dinner. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So that's what we do. We go and uh, we we have a couple of drinks, and it did get packed. That was a really well attended event so we're leaving to go to dinner and right across the street is i think it's wild horse gallery uh -huh. richard galusha owns it with uh, another woman i think so i said we got to go before we go to dinner i'm going to show you this gallery it's right across the street from the steamboat art museum so we go over a fantastic work you know just blow you away to see these paintings so the rancher is in there with his wife who i was painting at for two days on their ranch so I introduced them to my family and um, they just happened to be in there they were going to the show across the street at the museum and this guy comes up he, Richard Galusha he was introduced himself he was the owner of the gallery and he says what are you doing in town I said well I'm in the show across the street and uh, you know uh, we're going to dinner now and uh, so he he looks at me and he goes what's your name and I go, what was she? He goes, what was your name again? I go, Rich Alexander. So he goes, well, hold on here one minute. Wait a minute. And he goes back to his desk in the back of the gallery. He opens up a drawer and takes out a paper, reads it, puts it back in the desk, and he walks over to us. And he goes, you going out to dinner? And I go, yeah. He goes, if I was you, I'd go to the award ceremony. <laughs> and I was like, are you kidding me? I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe it. Yeah. It was, I mean. Hey, tipped you off. It blew. My, I would have missed it. Yeah. I figured, what? I'm, how am I going to win an award with these people? That's amazing to win an award with your family present, right? Oh my God. Yeah. It was unbelievable. Yeah, yeah, it was fantastic. I was so giddy. I still am. That stuff. That stuff can keep you going, you know. Oh yeah, and you've won many awards since. You've won. Um, I mean, we've been in the American Artists Professional League. We both won 
I think, an award. I don't think I won one. You didn't win one there? I know you win Ridgewood every yeah. year. Yeah, I won. So I think me and you got three awards together, which is always cool. Yeah. It's like, who's going first? Oh, it's fantastic. Kind of thing. Yeah, Who are they going to call? It's fantastic. So at Steamboat, when I got that award, my friend Rebecca Lear, who was... Um, oh, yeah. She's Ridgewood. She, yeah, she's an instructor. I, I studied with her after John left. She won an award at Ridgewood. I mean, at uh, OPA National in, in Steamboat. And I start screaming. I'm like, yes, yes. So, the, you know, the whole place starts clapping and they're looking at me. And then they're looking, they're waiting for her to come up. So now it, it, there's this like this awkward silence amongst a couple of hundred people. And I go, uh, she's not here. I'm just her friend, you know. Oh, that's awesome. I was so excited. Well, that's like being a, a teacher. You've got to be thrilled with uh, when you see your students do well. I mean, that's just Absolutely. so rewarding. I, can... Yeah, there's definitely like, you know, in the art world, I think there's some people that um, aren't cheerleaders, but I gravitate towards the ones that are positive and excited and surround myself with those people. And I'm just thrilled every time I see you win an award or doing anything or Dorothy wins all the time. Yeah, And I'm just like giddy for you all that we're, we're all doing it. And it's so rewarding and happy to to have uh, to be recognized yeah. among your among your peers and yeah. or to sell. Uh, it, it's a hard profession, but very very rewarding. Yeah, it really is. Yeah, it really is. But yeah, it, it's awesome. And uh, but so you're also board of directors now. What's some of the duties you do on there? Yeah, that was interesting. I got asked to interview for the board and. Um, I was told I was interviewing for a, a vol. I would be interviewing for a volunteer position, just come and help out. And then Susan Abma called me. She's the president of OPA, and she said, "No, I would like you to interview for the board." So I did, and they uh, took me on the board. Amazing. And uh, you know, it's funny you get you get responsibilities that come with that, and now you're vested into this organization. You want the best for it. Yeah. So uh, it so happens that. I think one of the things you do on the board is you, you critique, you do critiques. Yeah. So OPA members can, I think even non OPA members can submit for a critique. So I happen to, uh, they assigned me a, a woman from uh, the Midwest and, uh, I critiqued her. She sent me, she sent in, uh, eight paintings and that's an interesting thing to realize how much you really know about painting when you're, criticizing someone else's work yeah and uh you know i take it for granted i've been painting for you know 13 years now 10 12 years whatever it is you learn a lot you know when you really apply yourself like we have you much more than me but uh in the when i s surmised my critique at the end it was very positive and she's a very good painter um i said there, here's a list of things you can do to get better and one of the things on my list was by Todd Casey's <laughs> The Art of Still Life. Oh, thank you. It is the best book ever written on oil painting. Oh. And I, I'm saying that because I can take you out to the library here and upstairs. When I was starting, I just wanted, to, I de was devouring books, just devouring books. And there's a lot of good books out there, but I think yours is, is the best. So I, I send, you know, I send her my letter and um you know one of the things i think if you, i think i told her if there's one thing you can do to get better is to get this book and study it and apply the techniques and uh you know todd's lessons just use them and she wrote back yeah i already have his book it's my favorite uh, that's awesome well your name's in it as a acknowledgement uh did yeah. you see you saw that right yeah 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 i mean all of you as uh teachers and students um as i always tell dorothy i'm like the motivation to write the books is for you because i wish i had them when i was a student but uh, i appreciate the kind words you know, i'm telling you i you know i don't have to make that one up well there there probably be more books i keep getting asked and uh yeah. you know the positive comments are always nice to hear and there's a lot of positives uh but yeah it's just more time these days you know with kids involved and yeah. Galleries and teaching and podcasts. I still can't believe you did that. 
in because we I can't were, believe I did either. We were working. I was taking your class at the time. And yeah. you, you know, you'd right come in. Right before Scarlett was born. Yeah, you would come into the, at the end of the class, you would sit and you would talk about things in the book. And I remember that. You were part of the the talks. But see, that's where it came out of. Um, I had a lot of downtime. I didn't have a lot of downtime. I still made my myself so that I would teach on Fridays with you. And I used to drive to Mass Art when I was writing it once a week. But that downtime, I tested everything with you all. You know, like, you know, we'd talk about the chapter that I was writing and some of the ideas, but I was always listening to what you all needed. And I think that's why maybe they're successful. Uh, but, you know, like, it's not just the book I want. It's all the book. It's all the stuff that you all wanted at the same time. So I was always listening and taking notes. So, yeah, kudos. That's uh, why you, you are, are acknowledged in the books. Yeah, I think if you dropped, you dropped a novice artist on an island with all the supplies they needed in that book, they could do well. You Thank could, you. you know, that book didn't exist when I started. And um, uh, I wish it did. It would have probably made it a lot easier. You also did some reading. I remember on the color book, I think you read one of the chapters or two, and then I would ask for feedback. And I think you, you were always honest, and, and it was great. So thank you. Was, you're, you're of your hand in them. There'll be more, and, yeah. you know, I'll reach out. Yeah. Well, it's an art, too, to write, I it's think. It's tough. Um, it's an art. But, you know, it's also, it keeps you honest. You've taught in the as well, and I'm sure those critiques that you sent to the woman in the Midwest um, keep us sharp, because the things that I am telling somebody else to do, I now have to say, are you doing that? You know? Yeah. And then I remind myself, so I've always seen it as a kind of a reverb coming back to refine me and keep me honest but well let's get back to your uh let's talk about some of the themes in your work uh -huh. so you actually paint some of the the props from your fireman days yeah i remember i actually borrowed a couple of them the helmet uh, and i thought i don't know if i could do this justice i remember i was just fascinated by the props and and you let me borrow them and i was like i think it was somebody else's helmet um, was your dad a firefighter? It was, yeah. There were. I have two. I have one was my dad's old one. Yeah, and yours, right? Yeah. And I just thought, not not that it wasn't inauthentic, but I like to live with the props and then come up with ideas and see how they speak to me and live with them. And and I looked at them and I just thought, I don't have an idea yet, but Rich would. I mean, you have so many stories, and I think that's one of the things I told you to dig into, like you. Right. Yes. Yeah. And and I always I don't know if I was throwing out the quote at the time, but the um, oh, who wrote the picture of Dorian Gray? What's his name? Um, anyway, Zane somebody? Not Zane. It's um. Oh, I'll think of it after. <laughs> but he says, um, "Be you. Everyone else is taken." Yeah, you know. That's a good one. But like, so, so there's a lot of you every time I see your pictures, you know, in our conversations and stuff like that, that I'm like, that's rich. Like, that's awesome. You're kind of finding your authentic voice in the work. I think when we first began still life painting, and again, I think you wanted to be a landscape painter, but now you found a voice in still life. I didn't set out to be a still life painter, but then I just found this beautiful genre that uh, gave me the ability to kind of express myself. Do you want to add anything to that? Um, we don't have to go into too much of them, but yeah, you know, it definitely feels like you're in a happy place when you're making them. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, they're they they, uh, they evolve sometimes with a meaning, and I'll never forget, you know, taking your class, that Friday class. You know, you said, you know, make your picture tell a story, make yeah. your painting tell a story, and. Um, no one had, no one told me that up until then. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So I think about old vintage things and rusty things, and you know, dust in the north light is just a bluish, beautiful thing. So yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm kind of addicted to it. Yeah. But, but you know, I I, I I saw the um the the interview you did with Julie Beck, yeah. and she said it takes her, you know, she can look at something for a year before she. Puts yeah. together a, 
a setup for a still life. Yeah, so, the idea has to flourish and yeah. bloom into uh, a good idea. Yeah. So, Sometimes I'll even paint the same thing over and over and over. Yeah. And I, the first three got me to the good one. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So I find that a lot. And sometimes I'm motivated by, like, I've got a painting in here of an old box with a lock on it with a vase, a glass vase on top with sunflowers in it that are chained down to a platform. Yeah. And it was kind of motivated by the war in Ukraine. Yeah. Because I think their national flower is a sunflower. Yep. Yeah. And um, how disturbing, you know, things can be in, in the world. And, and you did a vice with the, with the microphone for the freedom of speech. Yeah. I saw that in the show. Uh, I gave you an award. And it's not because I know you. It was just like he's uh, he's saying something. Yeah. Like you have something in that painting that I was like, yeah, that's. You know, some people are are afraid to make an opinion or a stance or something like that, and uh, and then they'll just paint something pretty or beautiful, and there's nothing wrong with it. Not yeah. being pejorative and saying it, but but then I see like Max is social realist. He has a lot of meaning in everything that he's doing, and I. I start to see it in your work too, putting a chain around something or a vice, uh, which is, yeah, saying something. Yeah, yeah, saying something. You know, like uh, the nineteen fifties. They well, it still holds true today. Religion, politics, and sex. I think are something that you really can't talk about. But if you had, if you had something that you wanted to say on social media regarding politics, it would be, it would be. Uh, taken down or edited so to convey something in art is interesting you know well and you put yourself out there and you tried it and it seems like it opened the door for you to be like i just have something to say right yeah and yeah. now you're you're doing it more i love it yeah i just did that the one that was in ridgewood that just got an award that was a a, a, a weather vane and a vice and the indicator on the weather vane top the arrow there was a peace sign in the back of it and it was just disintegrating into the background mm. which is I, I think a lot of people would look at that painting not even notice that you know yeah well that's I talk about that a lot with students symbol without the meaning and some people just look at things and just go that's interesting but then you look at what you're trying to say and there's a message in yeah. the work and I think that's awesome yeah yeah, yeah. it's a blessing to it's be great. Able, it's a blessing to be able to sit here with you and and to be able to, you know, paint with people I love. And, uh, you know, I feel honored to be sitting here. I know there's if you probably looked at it, um, if there was a list of of potential candidates for you to sit with an interview, I think I'm I'm probably cutting the line here a little bit. No. And I appreciate that. No, but, no, uh, no. there's no line. Um, I, I know, but I just, I mean, uh, you know, I'm honored to be here and, uh, yeah. you know, I'm honored to have you on. Yeah. I just, look, you know, what's funny is like we have these conversations and, uh, and I feel like this is just honestly what artists talk about. Obviously it's a little like there's cameras involved now and we're recording, we have mics, but, yeah. but there's something more real in the, the, the discussions that you and I have over coffee or lunch or sitting down. You know, we don't just talk about sports or something like that. It's like sometimes you do argue or you debate and we listen to each other or whatever it is, right? And it's like, it's just a beautiful thing, but that's where these are. Like to hear somebody's perspective and where they come from and what they've gone through, I think is a, it's just a wonderful thing. It's fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. Art has done, done that for me. Um, you know, I've, I met when I was driving across country painting to go to that show in Utah, I met, I was painting in um, Pine Valley, Utah. I was mm. actually sleeping in my van there too. There was a little federal campground and I saw a bug museum, mm -hmm. a sign for a bug museum. I'm like, I gotta stop in here. It was a yeah. little building. I go in and there was a, a- Entomologist? Yeah. Yeah. And he was, he worked for the Smithsonian. Yeah. He would go all over the world to collect. There were bugs in there that looked like chrome, like they were chrome. Yeah. I'd never seen them before. So I start chatting to the guy. He was a, a door gunner in a heli medevac helicopter in Vietnam. Wow. What a, what a life story this guy had. And if it hadn't been for painting, 
and my painting journey, I would have never heard it. Yeah. It was absolutely fascinating. It's amazing how kind of serendipitously we find things. And I don't know. I mean, I feel like being an artist is just staying a kid. Right? You're just like, I'm going to get in my van and I'm going to drive off and paint wherever the my heart takes me. Yeah. It's a beautiful place to be. Again, back to your beginning with kind of your story. Um, it's not sitting behind a desk and uh, doing that one thing, yeah. which is maddening sometimes, but to, to each their own. So Yeah, absolutely. Awesome, man. Well, it's it's been a pleasure talking to you and uh, thanks for, for taking the time. It's been great. Thanks. Awesome.